Peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. We begin today with a prayer. Lord, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to saving faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, that as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you sent it. This we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It was about a month ago uh, that the new Star Wars movie, The Force Awakens, was released to theaters. Uh, being a big Star Wars fan, I have been very eagerly awaiting for this movie to come out. The best and the worst part about waiting was not knowing much about the movie. For those of you who've kind of followed this whole thing, um, you know that they kept so much of that movie's plot under wraps. The stars of the film weren't able to say much in their interviews. The, pre the trailer didn't even tell you all that much. You just saw all these cool scenes that didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. It was a movie that was shrouded in secrecy. That is, until it came out. And then the floodgates were open. People were talking about it everywhere. I couldn't go anywhere where I could hardly hear somebody saying, Oh, did you see Star Wars? I actually had to boycott Facebook for a while because I hadn't gotten to see it and I was afraid that they would spoil the movie. Trying to avoid those spoilers is such a hard thing. The reason I mention all that is because our reading for today in the Gospel of Luke is actually kind of a spoiler, a preview of the rest of Luke's Gospel. But unlike Star Wars, we actually find out a great deal about who Jesus is, about what he's come to do, and they even tell you how the story's gonna, going to end. So as we dive into this reading today, we're going to see these three parts of Jesus' story as revealed in even this reading from the beginning of his ministry. We'll see revelation, we'll see restoration, and even rejection. Our text begins right after Jesus has successfully withstood his 40-day temptation in the wilderness by Satan. He has just begun his ministry in the areas around Galilee and finds himself back in his hometown of Nazareth on the Sabbath. Being the perfect son of God, Jesus is there for worship at the local synagogue, and when the time for the reading of the scripture came, Jesus got up and took the scroll of Isaiah. He goes right to the passage that he's looking for, and begins to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now everyone seated in the synagogue knew that this passage was one of the servant songs of Isaiah, one of the prophecies about the coming Messiah. Everyone was waiting on the edge of their seat to see what Jesus would say. Because many had thought John might have been the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. Some people thought Jesus might be that anointed one. It was so quiet, you could have heard a pin drop. And Jesus says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus claims that he is indeed the long-awaited Messiah. This is the moment that reveals who he is. There's no games, no hiding. Luke re or Jesus reveals himself to them as the Christ. Now Jesus doesn't only do that for those gathered in the synagogue that day. Jesus also does this for people like you and I every day. Each time we gather around the Word, who do we see? We see Jesus. From the prophecies that cover the pages of the Old Testament to the epistles of Paul, the whole scriptures point to Christ, our Messiah, our Lord, our Savior, who would die on the cross for us. With eyes of faith fixed on him, we see Jesus for who he is 
And we praise Him for all that He's done for us. That leads us to the next point of the preview, the restoration that comes in Christ. Jesus has revealed Himself as the Messiah who fulfills the words in Isaiah 61, which he read in their hearing. At the same time, by saying that he fulfills the scriptures, Jesus is in effect announcing the purpose for why he came. Jesus has come to bring restoration. As the revealed Messiah, Jesus comes to bring good news to the poor. It's nothing less than restoring us who are poor in spirit, who are not able to repay the debt that we owe God for our sins. His good news is that He will pay that debt for us by His own death and resurrection. Jesus also comes to proclaim liberty to the captives. How many times have we felt that we are captive in our sin? No matter how many times I try to control my anger, no matter how many times I try to stop doing this or stop doing that, we sometimes feel like we're captive to our sin. But Jesus comes to proclaim liberty and freedom from the shackles of our old sinful nature. We are made new creations in Christ every day, daily dying to ourselves and being raised up as the free children of God. Jesus also brings recovery of sight to the blind restoring the eyes of faith which had been blinded by unbelief and sin. With this restored sight, we again see Jesus for who he is and what he does. We live by the eyes of faith, not trusting our own wisdom, but trusting that God has all things in his control. No matter how bad things may look in this life, we know that with eyes of faith, our sight can be fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And while we may not have the answers to the questions that we ask of why this, why now, we still, through faith, are able to see and trust in God's plan and above all, His mercy. Jesus says that He also comes to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Much like the freedom that we experience from our captivity of sin, Jesus frees us from the oppression of our guilt. You know how it is when you're struggling with a particular sin, when you have that day where just nothing seems to go right and you just lose your temper. We all carry around guilt and shame over those sins. That guilt and shame comes between us and our relationship with others. We fear, are they still mad at me? What are they thinking? Is God still mad at me? Satan comes and he likes to prod. How could God ever love a person like you? You know those sins. You can hardly love yourself thinking about them. So imagine if somebody else found out maybe about that secret sin. And yet Jesus proclaims, that all of those sins, all of that guilt, is taken away. The wedge that sin drive and guilt drives between us and God and between us and others, those sins are separated from us as far as the east is from the west. And knowing that forgiveness from God enables us to experience that forgiveness with others, that restoration of relationship. Jesus indeed proclaims liberty to our oppressed consciences. And finally, Jesus comes to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I don't know how many of you remember this kind of obscure fact from your Old Testament knowledge, maybe from Sunday school or another sermon, but in the Old Testament, every 50th year was a year where all debts would be forgiven, all slaves were set free, even the land would rest for a year. It was supposed to be a year of celebration, of freedom, of rest and restoration. Jesus says that in me, that Old Testament celebration is fulfilled because with Jesus, each day 
is that year of Jubilee, where we rejoice in the freedom and rest that we have in Christ. You can see how restoration would mark Christ's ministry. This was the purpose of his mission, to restore all things on heaven and earth to a relationship with God the Father and to restore a world without sin. But this mission of forgiveness and restoration, as we know, would cost Jesus dearly. And that brings us to the third and final mark of Jesus' ministry revealed in this sort of trailer, this spoiler we see in Luke's chapter 4. Jesus reveals himself, he restores all creation, but he does so at the cost of his own rejection. Jesus makes it very clear that the people of Nazareth would not receive him for who he is. Although he revealed himself to them, they would only see him as Joseph's son, the son of a carpenter. They didn't see him as the prophet and Messiah that he was. And just like in the days of old, it was like with Jesus. Just as the Israelites in Elijah and Elisha's day did not accept them, so the people in Jesus' day, and even today, would not accept him. Just like in the days of old, Jesus would take his message of revelation and restoration to those who would accept it, to the Gentiles. I don't know how many of us here actually have that Jewish background, but that would mean us, Gentiles. In Jesus' day, hearing that message, it only angered the people of Nazareth all that much more. As the scripture tells us, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up to drive him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down a cliff. But Jesus would pass through that crowd unharmed because his time had not yet come. But three years later, Jesus would find himself facing rejection again. The start of his ministry would be just as the end of his earthly ministry. The crowds would once again be filled with wrath, but this time they would call out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Jesus would then be driven out to another hill, the hill of Calvary, where he would face death, even death on a cross. He would be rejected by God the Father as he paid the punishment for the sins of the world thus fulfilling his mission and bringing us to a restored relationship with God. As revealing as this whole story is, as much as it is a spoiler when you look at it for the life of Jesus, there is one thing that it doesn't tell us. There's one surprise that is still in store. And as Christians, we know that surprise. We know that death and rejection was not the end for Jesus. Rejection would turn to acceptance as God the Father would raise him from the dead and as his disciples would see the full revelation and purpose of his plan. And even now, as we live in that time, when we proclaim this story to the world, we await a time when that restoration would be full. A time when Jesus will come back and reveal himself as the Son of God once again. But this time, every knee will bow on heaven and earth, and all who trust in Him, and even creation itself, will be restored. What a day that will be. It's a promise that is given in the Scriptures, a promise fulfilled in Christ. To even today, this Scripture is fulfilled in our hearing as we look to Christ our Savior, and our Lord. So there you have it. A spoiler alert of Jesus' mission. All of his ministry, his mission as the Messiah of revelation, of restoration, and even rejection are seen here in this passage from Luke. And even as we live in that story of God today, we see all of those same things happening for us. 
Jesus restoring and revealing himself to us each and every day, now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.